Oh yeah. Thanks Piper. Appreciate it. So just a quick background for everybody. Uh, We're with rebuild group. We've we've been in Milwaukee junction just North of Wayne state for a couple of few years now, actually we're in a brand new building in that neighborhood in the last year. We're a marketing idea shop. We aspire to be like IDEO, if you're familiar with IDEO. Uh, we, we really live and breathe in the brainstorm aspect of what we do, and that's why we're here today. We're very excited to share with everybody some tactics we've uncovered and put into uh, this presentation, and also into a deck of cards as well, which we'll talk about at the end. They look like this, and we're gonna have a certain amount we can give away if you're interested. So, you know, why you should care about this, we're really, like I said, we're passionate about making brainstorming available to all businesses, especially how to do it best. So we're gonna walk through a bunch of those tactics um, further into this presentation, but to start it off, I wanna give it to Eric and uh, let him dig into some of the the nuances of brainstorming rules. So um, we're gonna cover several things in here. One is we're gonna go through some rules and um, let me see if I can get this to go to the next slide. That would be nice. There we go. Um, I've, over my career, I've facilitated over a thousand brainstorming sessions. And over that time, um, you know, it, you start to notice trends. And I, I'd be lying to you if I said every single session I led went well. So in the culmination of that, there's certain rules you follow that allow you to get superior results and create actionable ideas for your business. So I'm going to share some of these rules for you. Then we're going to get into the cards. And the cards, as Steve referred to, are based on artists and what they do to actually come up with great ideas. So let's kick it off with a few rules. The first rule is create a jamming play bo- or sandbox. Excuse me. Um, there's an old adage out there that says there's no such thing as a bad idea. Well, I'm here to tell you there is. And the reason is, is that there's brainstorming sessions out there that lack focus. And I'm sure you've been in some of these where, hey, let's just put everything on the wall and see what sticks. The problem is, it's, I refer to that as free range chicken ideation. You had no focus, so you're just coming up with a bunch of ideas. And many of the, those ideas aren't actual because you didn't go deeper. So the goal of, goal of a sandbox is to define the boundaries. So that instead of going wide, you actually go deep. And as a facilitator, what you do is you force the conversation deep and you build upon these ideas very positively. It's not like you're negative in there. So the sandbox is the first thing, is really to define a tight sandbox so that you can come up with very actionable ideas. Secondly is get the size right. Um, Many times people actually put 50 people in a room and they go, hey, let's go out brainstorm and it just doesn't work too few people and you don't get enough diversity of thought. So the, the magic number here is seven or six to eight. Reason being is if you go below six, you have, a, you have a tendency of lacking that diversity of thought I just mentioned. If you go over eight, you get what's called uh, these group, you get these group dynamics where some people get intimidated, they shut down and group theory dictates that certain people rise up and not everybody contributes. So when you build out a brainstorming group, the ideal size is from six to eight, or as I said, seven. With that, if you have the luxury of, let's say, 21 people or, you know, 30 people, break them into multiple groups, but then look at their mindsets and align people that think alike. An example of this, I've spent many of my years in advertising, and you have two types of thinkers. You have conceptual thinkers and you have literal thinkers. Conceptual thinkers love thinking in the ideas and the concepts and they feel comfortable there. Literal thinkers think in web pages. They think in 30 second commercials. They think maybe in a project plan. Both are necessary. So I'm not saying one's better than the other, but by mixing them together, what happens is human nature takes over. So if you're thinking of a big idea on something and somebody goes, well, I wanna contribute, they're gonna pull it into their area and make it about them. So often what we do is we split people up in the way they think. And again, conceptual versus literal is just one way to think about it. Often it could be on where you are within a company. It could be engineering versus HR. So aligning mindsets is critical 
And you still want to cross pollinate, but you want to make sure that people think alike. That way you get more out of the sessions. Safe, bo safe zone for ideas. This seems like an obvious one. You should be able to get in a brainstorming session and feel comfortable to contribute everything. But I've been in a session, I've been in some sessions where that's not the case. For example, there's one that was led years ago by um, a person, an account person at an ad agency. And we started throwing ideas up there and, and, and somebody threw an idea and he goes, well, I can't really sell that to the client. What else you got? Again, the goal of brainstorming, and I'm going to touch on this second, is you have people in a room for a short period of time. Get as many ideas out of people as you can. You can always kill the ideas later. So you've got, people got to feel a safe zone for con contribution so that they can come up with as many ideas as possible. Then you can move to the next level. The next rule is be in the room. This used to be all devices off. Um, Steve, what, do, what don't we want in the room? Dead chairs. Yeah, dead chairs. It's a term we use because people don't contribute. Sometimes it's because they're distracted and on their phone. Sometimes it's just because they don't feel like contributing. If you're limiting it to six to eight people, everybody needs to contribute like this band. They're having fun. Everybody's into it. You can't have somebody sitting there and not participating. So at Rebuild, it's a privilege to be in these brainstormings, and you need to participate while you're in there. Because if you're not, somebody else could be in there and contributing. So it's very important people are not distracted and they're in the room. And there's a couple of cards we're going to play later on how to help focus people and be in the room. Great intellectual breaks. Um, over my career, I've, been, I've had people approach me and go, I want to do a workshop. I want to do brainstorming for eight hours. I'm here to tell you that most people's limit for brainstorming is about two hours. You need a break after that. So often what we'll do is we'll do two sessions in a day. We'll do it from 10 to 12 and three to five, but there's a break in between so you can recharge your brain. Better yet, if you have multiple sessions, for example, we did a session last year with Homedics. They're a product company out of Commerce, Michigan. They do massages and stuff like that. We did 10 sessions in a week. But these sessions were broke up, and actually what we did is we put a weekend in between. Because walking away from the brainstorming for a while, it, it sort of resets your brain, and you'll be surprised what ideas get triggered by this. So very important to take, create intellectual breaks. Last but not least, use an experienced facilitator. Up in, in my experience, it, people are just anointed. Okay, who wants to facilitate this? And they get up and they just start doing it. Again, I'm not trying to, we're, we're not trying to pick on anybody by saying this, but the goal is to come up with actionable ideas, just not ideas. So often we take this and we go facilitate for other companies to help them come up with ideas. Many companies who are idea focused need to invest in experienced facilitators, whether they have them on staff and they train them or they bring somebody in on a regular basis but it's night and day when you use an experienced facilitator or not. So those are the seven rules. Now let's jump into the fun stuff. Now that we ruled you to death, <laughs> let's um, have a little fun with the playbook, Steve. And I failed, so I failed to mention earlier on, Eric, too, I mean, this is really about getting people out of their comfort zone. Yeah, good you, point. Showed, you showed the Motel Museum earlier in the, in the slides, and I said we're less than a mile away, but we take it to heart so much about getting you out of your comfort zone that our orientation uh, for new employees starting last year, back in 2019, before uh, everything changed, we actually did our orientation for employees at the Motown Museum. And if you haven't taken a tour before, I can guarantee you there's two or three parts you're going to feel uncomfortable as perhaps an introvert or somebody who doesn't want to stand up and dance or sing. Um, but it really brings that, that new group of employees together with someone to kind of rally and have experience together. So that is what the Jimmy Playbook is about. It's about getting people to just open themselves up and contribute, avoid those dead chairs, and, and above all, get the most out of the people, the environment, and the different methods that we have. So there's actually four categories. Um, Eric, if you want to flip just one slide to the playbook. There's the get ready. This is all the ways that you can prepare going into a brainstorm. Some of them you can do 10 minutes before or in the first minute of, or some require a day of prep or more. Um, we've got elevate, ways to notice that a brainstorm is sort of dying off. How do I 
put something in there right away that to kind of instigate and get people talking again. Infuse, what do I purposely seed into the brainstorm knowing I want to have a different thought process or some of that diversified thought in there. And then lastly, place, which has changed a great deal. In the last three months, we'll show you a couple of, or talk about a couple of examples of this, but um, changing the place really just provides this ambient um, effect on people's brainstorming tactics. So let's dive in. Let's, I'm sorry, let's start with get ready. Um, what you're gonna see in each one of these cards is an artist, an actor, a songwriter, and what they do and then how we take their method and we apply it to brainstorming. So the first one out of the gate is we call it Dustin Hoffman. And many of you know Dustin Hoffman is a method actor. He is passionate about getting in the role and living the role even when he's not on camera. And it's really interesting because when he did Marathon Man, um, he was just so into it that his um, character was supposed to be, or his yeah, character was supposed to be up for three days straight. So what did he do? Stayed up for three days. And so he played the scene um, in exhaustion, but that's what he did. It's method acting, it's getting there. We love this idea. And we've used it a lot. I've, I've used this for two decades, is live the life of your target. An example of this is I was at Organic, which is a digital agency in Detroit. And we were charged by Chrysler to rethink the buying process for millennials. So what we did is we took everybody in the brainstorming session who's going to brainstorm the next day who could pass for a millennial, which was everybody but me. And we sent them out to a Dodge dealership and two competitors. And they did that that evening and they showed up the next day. It's one of the best brainstorming sessions I ever ran because they walked in the shoes of the target. They felt there was empathy there. They got it. They got the process. So doing method, doing the Dustin Hoffman really helps you see the perspective of whomever you were brainstorming on. It works very well in marketing, but also can work in um, HR also, as a matter of fact. So the Cole plays Einstein, obviously Chris Martin is a fantastic songwriter, musician, uh, but he borrows a tactic that Einstein was famous for, which is before he sat down to do anything in a given day, he would take out a sheet of paper and just write down everything on his mind, nothing to do with inventing, nothing to do with creating, writing, whatever, it was just everything else. And if you can imagine, if we're hosting a session and we've got eight people sitting around you don't know what they're walking into that room with on their, their mind. I guarantee you something has happened moments before phone calls, text, emails to get the most out of the session with the people in it. A great way to cleanse that mental palate, get everyone to have a sheet of paper in front of them, write down everything on their mind that's personal. And in this kind of cathartic emotional exercise, you tear it up, right? And you get this kind of collective relief that we can, okay, I'm going to put that aside. That's my baggage. I'm, I'm going to worry about that in an hour or two hours from now. But it's a really effective way just to center everybody um, to get ready to, to brainstorm. The next card is the Tom Hattie, Tom Petty, excuse me. Um, there's many people who said, don't bore us, get to the chorus, but Tom Petty um, is stuck to him. And if you think about American Girl, I mean, it starts out right with the hook. And the hook's important, because remember, I just talked about sandbox is one of the rules. Often what we do, the hook becomes a North Star for your brainstorming. So we'll often do a pre-brainstorming if you don't have an objective or a sandbox to say, all right, what are we trying to accomplish here? More importantly, how do we know an idea is good? And what would be the hook? So often we'll go in and come up with a hook and then take that into brainstorming and energize everybody. So for example, we did some work with Treetops on Resort up in Gaylord. And they were trying to rethink their winter. And they have a ski hill, they have extreme tubing and everything else. But it wasn't really a hook, it was a list of stuff. So we sat back, we said, well, what's their hook? So we came up with this idea of Fam Jam. It's a family jamming out because they had over 50 activities. We took that to them and then we had brainstorming sessions with their experienced people up there to figure out how do we make more of this family jam session happen and then also it allowed us to create marketing around it. So that's an example of a hook and how you would a hook, use a hook to drive um, your brainstorming session. So the, the Nick Cave, if, uh, if you're a fan of Nick Cave, you may or may not know that he reads 30 minutes of poetry a day and that's for good reason. 
if you're looking for ways to, to have a fresh perspective and, and kind of mix up your thoughts and not just have that same templated approach you have to problem solving, poetry forces you out of your comfort zone. Uh, we actually at Rebuild, we do these Right Brain Mondays, kind of doing them uh, before everything had happened. But one of them, we went to the John R. King uh, Rare Brooks store and as a, as a group went in and uh, Nick from our office said, you have to go in there and buy something you wouldn't normally buy. Of course, I didn't listen to him, but everyone else did a very good job of that. And, and what we came out is, is really this repository of, of poetry books that if you've got five minutes or 10 minutes, even before a brainstorm, it's a great way just, again, to clear your mind, mix up those thoughts, and, and just kind of throw away some of the thoughts you might walk into that would necessarily open you up to a, an open brainstorm. Also, if you don't have time to go to a store, I was just, I was really paying attention to Steve, but I wanted to pull this up on my phone. <laughs> I can't see it all that well. It's a poetry app. You can download it um, off the iTunes store or off um, any store. And the thing is, I like what Steve's saying, because often this gets into you, you're getting your brain to operate differently, which is, again, it's that warm up Steve talked about. But that's it, elevate, or excuse, that's it, or um, excuse me, um, um, the, the God, I can talk. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> um, elevate, as Steve said, is taking your brainstorming to the next level. So he'll jump in with the first one here. Yeah, the Robin Williams, not only a favorite of many people on screen, uh, he's a favorite of ours because he's the master of improv. Uh, if you've ever done an improv class or, or know what one is, you're, you're often put on stage with a bunch of people and you have to build on whatever person, the person before you does. It's the power of and. And really the, the essence of this is so many situations you're gonna find yourself at a startup and a corporation with different levels of people, meaning their role is different. Someone's a leader, someone is, a, is carrying out, a, uh, carrying the torch on a certain project. They're gonna be different, they're gonna feel passionate in different ways. And that may shut down certain people in the room. So instead of saying, there's no buts or ors, because or is just a fancy but. The, it's, everything is and. We don't shut ideas down. We want to build on each other, get rid of that uh, difference in, in organizational structure, and just let's create a safe environment like Eric was talking about in the rules. Robin Williams is a really nice way to say, hey, I'm not, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say there's no buts here, but remember, we're doing the Robin Williams today. <laughs> there's only and. By the way, it's the however is the fancy ball. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, really fun, too, just to add on to this. It's self-policing because if you have two hours, um, but is the ultimate stifler of an idea. So we have the team self-police. And even if Steve or I use it, we get called out on it. And it becomes a lot. It, it creates a nice energy, a positivity in the meeting, too. And there's nothing more than I like calling you out, Eric. Because yeah, I, I get know. to do it so far in between. <laughs> Yeah, you and Snyder. Anyway, <laughs> The Simpsons. Um, Simpsons are really interesting because often to go to a new place, you have to, or an innovative place, you need to get rid of everything that's obvious. So The Simpsons is known for um, God, one of the longest running, if not the longest running TV show out there. And in 1995, roughly, Matt Gronick did an interview and he was asked, how do you come up with such innovative jokes or such interesting, clever jokes? And he goes, what we do first is we look out there to figure out what is all the obvious stuff happening, write it down, and you can't use that. And so automatically you're taking away all the obvious stuff and it, it, it is cathartic but challenging in your brain at the same time. So how we have used this in the past is we did some work um, for Midtown Detroit was a fabulous place, and we wanted to show the coolness of it. And by definition, you can't say you're cool. We all know that. So we're looking around to cities across the country like Austin, Seattle, and looking at how they talked about themselves. Put that up on the wall and then said you can't use it. Automatically, it got us to some really interesting territories because we went beyond the obvious. So it's a really interesting um, exercise to do, especially if you're trying to get out of um, historical, we've been there before type of things. Over to you, Steve. Your yeah, favorite. one of our one of our favorites here. Uh, so Bruno Mars uses this thing called syncopation when he when he creates music, 
And if you've ever been to a Bruno Mars concert, you will definitely know this because their syncopation is the purposeful leaving of gaps in the lyric or, or music. And the idea is that your body fills those gaps. Um, so Eric and I can't dance. So if, yeah. if we were ever to attend, it would be, it's, it's right here. We keep yeah, it right here. real tight. Right Nothing's happening. But people who can dance and sing, which we can do neither, uh, they fill it in because of that syncopation. So the idea here is we use Bruno Mars throughout um, a brainstorm session to really bring out that introvert who's had the idea. Maybe they've written some stuff down, but we can tell as we're facilitating, walking around saying, I know so-and-so is not contributing, make a mental note of that. And when enough of that time compiles, we pull Bruno Mars. We hand a, note, a note, uh, notepad or a piece of paper or a postcard out to everybody at the table and ask them to write down one thing that has not been said yet knowing there's two or three people who have had that thought just haven't had a chance to because someone else was busy talking, maybe not listening. Um, then they have to go around and read that singular thought to everybody else. So it gets them to, to advocate for their own idea and also and just make people listen, which is a, a rare skill sometimes in brainstorms. And it's a, again, like you said, it's a powerful tool to get people involved. Oops, went by Weird Al. Sorry about that. Um, most people probably know who Weird Al Yankovic is. Some people may not. He's was his heyday was doing the MTV generation, where he would um, do parodies of songs like, um, you know, it, it's like he did Madonna's song like a surgeon, like a virgin to like a surgeon. The interesting one I love is he did Michael Jackson's Bad into Fat, and he had to get permission from Michael Jackson to do it. Not only did Michael Jackson love the idea, he actually let them use the set that he actually did the video on to shoot Weird Al's um, set for Pat. So why am I bringing this up? Because I'm a fan of Weird Al? Maybe, but also it's, it's, what he does is he takes songs or popular things and spins them to a new place, which is his territory. And this is sort of what, it, this is what innovation is. Often if you're brainstorming about a marketing campaign, an HR idea, something in engineering, Look beyond your category. Look at what's working elsewhere, either in another category or another discipline, and spin it into yours. And they're great springboards to take and jump into say, well, this works here. Let's try it here. Sometimes it works great. Other times it doesn't. But it gets people thinking different. It gets you out of this category mindset that people typically have. So Holland Dozier Holland, if you if you aren't aware of who Holland Dozier Holland are, they are or were the number one writing team for Motown. Uh, they were the, the they were on the hits, they were writing for the hits, and what was really unique about what what they did was it was the two brothers. Um, they'd be in a restaurant, they would go out into the bar scene anywhere to get inspiration because they were energized by social interactions. Uh, the way we translate that today is through a practice we call digital ethnography which is the study of online conversations. Not one-off things, not a tweet here, a social post, an Instagram post there, TikTok, whatever it is. We're looking for thematic movements that you can study and bring to brands and, and infuse brainstorms with so that you're creating relevance to what a brand can offer, to what's truly happening, and also know when not to talk. There's, there's important times for both. Um, but understanding those conversations is really important. And one example of this Again, going back to an example um, Eric brought up with Homedics. They deal with products in the pain category, but at the time they weren't positioning it as a pain solving product. So we opened up some conversations that were happening in the chronic pain community. And one of which, and you can look it up today, look up a hashtag Spoonie. And if you don't know what a Spoonie is, um, a Spoonie is someone who suffers from chronic pain or diseases. And it's a community that lives online, started by a woman named Christina Missandino, and she was in a, in a restaurant and she studied behaviors and, and uh, chronic pain and illness. And her friend said, what's it like to, to have chronic pain? And she's in a restaurant like Leo's and she's got, gathers all the spoons on the table, puts them on the table and there's eight of them. And she says, when, when I get up, I, I use a spoon. When I eat, I use a spoon, I brush my teeth, whatever it is. Once those eight spoons are gone, I'm done. My pain thresholds hit, I'm at my max. And that's really what a Spoonie is. They're, they're looking for ways to extend their ability to do more in a given day. Um, it's not, it's just, it could be very simple things to very complex things. 
So for home medics, they really enjoyed the idea of chronic, of solving chronic back, back pain. And one thread we uncovered was called My Back Age. And if you go into Twitter right now and look up hashtag My Back Age, close the hashtag, or the, I'm uh, not hashtag, quotes, sorry, in air quotes, you will see a stream of conscious of people just talking about their back age. They'll say, my age is 22, my hairline's 32, my back age is 88. Um, so we're really able to turn that into a, a, something that meant more to their brand than just um, back problems. Cool. Um, who hasn't heard Bohemian Rhapsody? Um, it's a classical song or classic rock song that really, it's interesting because it, several things on it. First of all, it's had 1.6 billion downloads. That's amazing. And it hit uh, charts in the UK twice as a number one, once when it was released, then two weeks after Freddie Mercury died in um, 1991. The reason it's in here is because it's that operatic section and how they just layered everything in. And why layering is important is when you look at an idea, often idea sounds great or it sounds okay, but by brainstorming on that idea for five minutes and coming up with layers to what else could it be? What else could it be? What else could it be? Something wonderful happens. Some of the ideas that seem a little bit like an ugly duckling just blossom into something wonderful. Other ideas that just sound great, you find out there's no depth to them. So when we do the Bohemian Rhapsody, often it's, it's really coming up with layers for an idea to, to figure out the merits for that idea and prove whether it'll work or whether it won't. So the, the Dr. Dre, this is a, this one gets pulled out of the deck even when we don't talk about it or use it in an active brainstorm because people find it and they're attracted to it. But Dre is obviously known for, for remixing classics into something new and awesome. He's done it for Joe Cocker, Funkadelic, Metallica, Billy Joel, you, you can name it, there's a whole bunch. So the way we use it in brainstorm, um, I don't give you an example of this, we're at a global HR convention and there's tables of eight scattered around a room of 40 some people and we're facilitating the sessions. We had used other cards in there, but they were thinking through a better way to share employee experience across um, continents. And, and someone saw the Dre card and, and thought of other, she quietly was building ideas um, that were used previously, maybe 10, 20 years ago before the internet existed. And at the end of the session, when we were doing our share out and, and talking about the ideas to improve employee experience, she stands up among her peers, um, probably newer than a lot of them to the company and says, what, what, what? we pulled a Dre and we're going to, we turn modern, we turn the pen pal program into a modern program. And they had this whole idea conceived around the human element of someone from a different continent reaching out um, through translation to share a really effective idea of how they created engagement between their, their uh, employees. So it can be used many ways. As we, you know, we might have thought of it as a marketing tactic, but it turns out it can be used for uh, things including reinventing the pen pal program. Nice. Nirvana. Nirvana is fascinating because um, they came to um, – really came to be known during the heyday of the hair bands, which is more my, my speed at the time. And so hair bands about glitz, million dollar video, stuff like this. And Nirvana said, no, we're going to do the opposite. They actually did the album Nevermind with an initial budget of $65,000. Now they spent a little bit more than that. But what they did is they started the grunge movement by inverting the status, status quo. And this is a powerful tool in brainstorming is to, to is certainly even if you did the Simpsons a little bit, what is the status quo now? Invert it. Is there an opportunity there that we can take advantage of it? This works very well in marketing. It works very well internally to rethink how your company may work is inversion. So this is a very powerful card to play, especially if you feel you're stuck in the status quo. So the, the Wilco, uh, if you're not familiar with the band, they were often on a bus doing their tours and they leaned into this game. Uh, it was an old surrealist world, uh, word game called Exquisite Corpse. And what that meant was on their, on their rackety bus, they'd have a typewriter in the very back. And whenever felt 
uh, whenever someone felt like they could go to the back and they could read the line that was last typed. And for anybody who hasn't seen a typewriter recently, they only show one line clearly that you can read and then they require a, a click um, or an enter. But you, the idea was you would read that one line, click it, and you would add one line. And what you really get is this truly surreal, ridiculous stream of conscious, um, but a great way to, to kind of pick up and run with a brainstorm that, that's, again, maybe hitting some kind of stalling point. So in facilitation, what we'll do is we'll take an index card, place it in front of everybody, and then you'll write your one, one person starts, and they write their thought down. They show it to the person to the right. They have to rewrite that line, flip it over, and add a line. And then that goes around the group. And once you get to the end of that, the group has to read their one line in order. And you get this weird, again, surreal, almost verbal Picasso looking um, thing that just tends to lead to, to new thoughts for people and open up your mind. Yeah, I love you doing so. Find out weird things about the people in the brainstorm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. share, don't scare. Um, <laughs> four seasons. Uh, we're going to, I'm, been an eye on the clock. Neither Steve or I are project managers, so it's like you knew this was going to go long. So we're going to speed it up so we have enough time for questions. So Four Seasons, pretty much what it says, it's calendar mindset. Um, a lot of songs are based on the seasons. For example, George Harrison um, actually wrote Here Comes the Sun on a spring morning in Eric Clapton's garden way back when. And we use this for different clients, and we look through the prism of the different seasons and the seasonal mindsets. We did this for a financial institution to understand how people spend or don't spend money or, or how they process their finance based on the winter, the spring, the summer. And then there's this bizarre bookend thing between summer and holiday season where people sort of take some time off. But anyway, the idea here is that using the four seasons to actually come up with ideas throughout the year. Well, let's jump into Infuse, starting with the Funk Brothers, Steve. Oh. Yeah, so, the, so in effort to keep things moving quickly, the Infusing is about, again, how do I make this session better by setting it up appropriately? And if you don't know who the Funk Brothers, if you do know who the Funk Brothers are, great for you. If you don't know who they are, go watch Standing in the Shadows of Motown. Uh, the Funk Brothers are, were on more, more number one hits then the Rolling Stones, Beatles, Elvis Presley, and the Beach Boys combined. Over 50 number one hits. And you may have never heard of them, and that's sad. Uh, but what they were famous for more than anything was being the jam band for Motown. They were the guys that were always there, that were available. They played all the other instruments. They just weren't the lead singer. So the point being here, if you're in a small organization or, or large, and Eric and I have worked with both, uh, make sure you don't hesitate to pull in people from different categories or different and uh, organiza organizational elements, product planning, marketing, biz strategy, a, a developer. Um, and in our world, it could be marketing with a PR group or a social team, all talking as one. When you get that diversity of thought, you really get the, the team mentality. So Take It Easy, for those familiar with the Eagles, um, their first hit song was Take It Easy. They didn't initially write it, Jackson Brown did, but he got stuck. So he gave it to Glenn Fry, and Glenn Fry finished it up. And this wonderful handoff led to this, their first number one hit and a very memorable song. How we use this, and this is one um, card you need multiple creative teams to do. But the way it works is pretty simple. Let teams brainstorm for about an hour or so, and then they swap ideas. And it's really interesting because people think differently, teams think differently. And they'll take ideas into new spaces, plus you more, get more group ownership. So passing the idea with the take it easy is really a great way to create more of a consensus building idea or a powerful idea. The pink. So pink is known for many things, but one that she does really well pink. <laughs> is, is bringing in other category leaders, people in other music uh, categories and doing these mashups. Um, she's got 16 of her for hits on Billboard are all with these um, artists, including Steven Tyler, Eminem, Cher, Usher, uh, Naughty by Nature, Kenny Chesney, some really strange ones you would not imagine the pairing. But what's genius about this and why it's important when you're infusing brainstorms of your own is you can find a lot of value in bringing in somebody who, who knows that category and more importantly is very good at jamming. 
They're just fun to have in a room. We all know these people. If they're, if they're categories relevant to yours, bring them into the jam session, let them riff with you. Eric and I did this with a group, um, you know, down in Cleveland who came up to, to riff with us. And I mean, we've, we just have a lot of fun when you, when you bring in that, when you are either are that expert or you bring in someone else into your brainstorm. Right. Um, last one under and use the CBGB. Um, remember I told you about the 50 people needing to brainstorm. Well, what's interesting is that's what the CBGB is about. And if you're not familiar with CBGB, it's a bar created by Hilly Crystal um, in the late 70s. And it stands for Country, Blue, Grass, and Blues. Um, and it never really was about blues because it can be the epicenter for punk. And this is amazing. You had the Talking Heads, you had Blondie, you had the Ramones, you can go on Iggy Pop, on and on and on. There's a great um, video out there of Sting talking about they toured the Midwest and when they got invited to CBGB, they know they had it. The key to this was though, the key to this was Hilly actually gave every band two, two 20 minutes, 20, excuse me, two 20 minute sets a night. So you let everybody take the stage and the guesstimate is about 50,000 bands played between when it opened and then it finally closed in 2006. How do we use this? Well, working on Pure Michigan, we had to embrace people from across the state, marketers, and get them to do this. So what we did, brought them all together and put them into groups of roughly six to eight, and we had a facilitator facilitate each one. So we allowed everybody out there to be a part of it. Let, let all the marketers take a stage as opposed to just having the lead agency or the client do it, and it turned out fantastic. The place is the next one. Place is about inspiration, and there's a few under here. Um, one is Stephen King. I'd like to tell you this is a true story. It's probably more of an urban myth. A lot of the other things in here is based in fact, but it's an urban myth worth telling. So years ago, I was told this story about somebody who was riding the people mover and saw Stephen King. And, you know, your BS meter goes up a little bit. And they said, well, you know, he was going around and around and finally got up and asked him. I go, well, what do you say? He goes, well, I was observing people for my next book and taking down notes. And I go, this is interesting. We use this, we use places a way to get us inspired. So, for example, um, Rebuild has a wonderful building. You should stop by and see it. But we also go, we're right at the end of the queue line um, on East Grand and West Grand where they meet. We'll take it up and back and just brainstorm on it for about an hour. Um, we're near the DIA, so we'll go to the Kresge Cafeteria, which is a wonderful place to brainstorm. So often shifting your place can be very inspiring and highly recommended when you have the time. Another one, the, the Postal Service. So they were doing this before it was cool, long before, and long before you had to do things virtually. Um, back in actually it was 2001, it was uh, Death Cab for Cuties, Ben Gibbard, and then another solo artist named Jimmy Tamborello. They were basically in two different places. One would, would put together a riff, send it on a tape, literally in the mail to the other, and they would exchange these, these back and forth of, you know, turn the, tune this up, to, turn this on, whatever, all these different, just creating these amazing songs that it, they really ended up bringing into an album um, called Give Up. And it was one of only two sub pop albums to ever reach platinum certification. And to think that it all started via the mail is pretty awesome. Um, for us, we, we were working with Jeep, um, their product development team before everything happened with COVID-19. Uh, after it happened, we continued on. We've been doing virtual brainstorms. We had to leverage some technology that allows us to, to separate out groups if we need. Um, and, and a lot of a lot of planning goes into it. I would just, you know, add, I advocate for virtual collaboration. We, we love it, but just do the prep accordingly. Know who's attending, know what devices they'll be on. Do some of those mandates because you can really control and make this nice virtual connection still even today. So last but not least, the Lady Gaga, which is one of our favorite ones. So Lady Gaga is known for just getting up on stage at bars and just, um, you know, just doing like a pop-up concert. Um, different places like in London, Houston, New York. My favorite one was in New York, and I think it was um, the, the Bell Room or something like that. Probably got that wrong. She, she got up and covered two, tones, two tunes from Sinatra. So we really like this idea of this Lady Gaga and just being this improvisation of doing pop-up brainstorming. How we did this is we, had a, um, we did it for Michigan Science Center. 
we did brainstorming up in rebuild, but then one of the sessions we asked permission from the Michigan Science Center, and we actually did brainstorming on site. What a difference. We actually went around, it was immersive. We had two teams floating around there, just brainstorming separately. The ideas we came up with, is, if you can imagine, were just awesome because you were in the environment. So getting in to these, these areas where a person, back to the sort of the Dustin Hoffman, where your target may be, is wonderful inspiration within your brainstorming whenever you can pull it off. I, I can't remember the last time, Eric, when we were doing that set, the last time we had so many ideas floating that you had, we were walking around in groups of five and, and I remember each of us just talking to each other out the ideas because we were trying to remember them. <laughs> so, it, was, it was fabulous. And it's like, um, again, highly recommended. So probably I'm looking at time now and we're right at our limit. So using the playbook, I'm just going to fly through these, Steve. Yeah. All right. So the first thing is we get, here's some questions we typically get before we open it up to questions. Number one, how many cars do you typically use? Well, we went through 21 cars today, but normally you use about three to four for a single session. Now, if you're doing multiple sessions, you may use 10 to 15 because you vary it up. You look for scenarios and stuff like that to use it. Um, Steve, why don't you answer this one? What are the most used cards? Uh, I would say cold play is, is a very easy one to implement. And I saw that someone actually asked, do you actually tear that up? Absolutely. That's the best part of it. And you could even do this for yourself. You don't even need to do this before a brainstorm. Um, the Robin Williams is an, occurs every single time because it's just that the power of Anne really, like I said, level sets the playing field for everybody involved. And then now the Postal Service, I think you have to be open to virtual jamming. And there are ways to do it well. Love that one. The only one I would add to that is I, we had a lot of productivity using the Simpsons. So um, and one last question before that. we turn it over to your questions is how do you know what, what cards to use? We get this a lot and it's based on scenarios. So for example, sometimes you're looking and you're going to see different people in there and you know it's going to be intimidating for some. And Steve brought this up. The Bruno Mars is great for introverts. If they're intimidated by brainstorming, about 10 minutes in, you pull a Bruno Mars, have everybody write down, as Steve said, and then have them share, go around, and they get comfortable sharing their ideas and also contributing to others. The Wilco is another one we like to use because it's the surreal thing where you go around the room, a lot of participation. Another one is group think. If you want to break through think, it's the Simpsons, which gets the, you know, away, you write down the obvious, pink, bring somebody in from the outside, and Nirvana is inverting the status quo. And then getting in a rut, change your place, the Stephen King or the Lady Gaga. So with that, um, are there any questions for pe that people have? Yeah, actually, there are a couple of questions that are in the Q&A. Okay. Um, well, you answered the one about, are these cards available, right? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Let, let, let us touch on that. My, my bad. Sorry, um, Piper. Um, we went through quite a bit. There's more on rebuild.group. And Steve, why don't you talk about the next one? Yep. So we have cards available. You can shoot me an email um, if you're interested in getting a pair or, or getting a, a deck. We are uh, still packaging and sending these out. So we'll, uh, it's kind of weird. We have to send to home addresses if you want to do them. We could also set up a spot for you to pick it up if you uh, would prefer our office down in Detroit outside. So just send me a message over email or LinkedIn and we'll get you uh, set up. I can't promise everyone will get one because we have to print them every time they run out. So either one way or another, we'll get, we'll get you a uh, deck though. As far as the format goes, there, usually on the front is the visuals we show, saw, you saw there. And on the back then, and it's, it's hard to read, I get it. It's um, a description, a short story of what the artist did or what the theme, theme is or method is about, and then how you apply it. So it's just very simple, one, one card, two paragraphs, and it's easy to follow. So another question that's in the Q&A is, uh, what did you do for the census? The census. I've, I mean, I mailed mine in. <laughs> I'm a little lost on the question, I apologize. Okay. Um, maybe Kimberly, you could restate your question, but we'll move to Linda Taylor's question. Do you train people to become facilitators? It's funny you bring that up, Linda. 
Um, we have got that request quite a bit. When we were at the HR summit, they said, will you be willing to do it? We're in the process of doing two things. One, we are writing a book, bringing this to life. And then two, we are actually putting together as a part of that book, the book's about how to use these methods to facilitate meetings. So yes, we're, we're hoping by the end of the year to have a facilitation workshop available for those that would be interested to learn how to do these methods. So if you're interested, again, email Steve or just reach out to myself, either one of us on LinkedIn. I would just add to that too, Eric. If, you're, if your company um, is interested, we are working with a handful of companies on doing these sessions more regularly. Uh, and that will ultimately probably include the facilitation. So there'll be a certification and everything with it um, later in the year. Uh, next question is um, tips for hosting an effective brainstorming session with 30 to 40 university students. So I would start with your rules. First thing is be very focused on what you're doing. Do your sandbox up front. Break the students into groups of no more than eight. Um, the trick here and the challenge is like when we talked about the CBGB. The challenge is, is getting enough facilitators so there's several ways to do this. One is if you are an experienced facilitator, what you do is instead of having people facilitate every session, you have note takers. Key thing to a note taker is do not have them get up and use a flip chart. And this may seem a little counterintuitive because when people use a flip chart, they're almost seen as a leader as opposed to a note taker. And that what you would do is the facilitators move from table to table to just encourage um, discussion, Maybe do a Bruno Mars 10 minutes in. Uh, make sure you play the Robin Williams so it's um, power band and definitely keep it to two hours. Uh, next question was Kimberly Restated uh, said, I thought you mentioned that you did some work with the census as one of your clients. Oh, that might be my Western Michigan accent. Um, <laughs> no, we did not do anything with the census. I'm trying to remember what word that was close to that. Uh, I think it was during the monthly mindset, Eric, if I, if I had to guess. Oh, it's a fine. Yeah, we did something for a financial institution um, where it was, the monthly, it was the monthly mindset, not the census. Thank you. Um, the last question here is, uh, can you talk a little more about grouping, like, like thinking, wait, 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 about grouping like, thinking people together for brainstorming. Oh, like thinking people. Yeah. Okay, can you talk a little bit more about grouping like thinking people together for brainstorming? So, and I like this, I wanna to talk to the second one too, cause you go hand in hand, wouldn't people be more stimulated by people who think differently? Right. You would, it depends on what your objective is. If your objective is to think through an HR process internally, you may do a cross sampling of everybody and get diversity of thought because everybody's on the same footing. Um, when we do brainstorming, we are very conscientious on looking at status in conceptual, uh, conceptual versus literal, which I talked about. Let me talk about status though. What's interesting is if you took an executive and put them in brainstorming with um, a group of, of subordinates, one of two things happen, grandstanding and shutting down. So we often will group executive level people together just because they're more peers. So and that's another example of grouping uh, mindsets together. So it's not a hard and fast rule is my point, but you be sure that um, when you think about how, how people process or contribute, you don't end up with a roadblock because you put people together that think very differently or could be stifling to other people in the group. So I think that's that's all the questions we have. Great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So um, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, this that's, is great. Very exciting. So it's, it's very bizarre presenting to a screen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, hopefully everybody enjoyed it again. Um, reach out to us at Rebuild. Um, connect with Steve or myself on LinkedIn. If you have any more questions or would like to talk about it further, we'd love to. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it.